Good afternoon, everybody. I am um, terribly privileged. I feel very privileged that uh, that I can uh, that I would be uh, presiding over this final event of extraordinary uh, conference. I'm speaking uh, from New York, and um, and this is the concluding event of the conference organized by the New Schools Memory Study Group. Um, under the wings of TCDS and dealing with the issues of suspended past and a hoovering future in a time of pandemic. The conference has brought together an extraordinary, truly extraordinary group of scholars, um, their contributions, rich discussions, and really intellectually inspiring visual journeys. Um, there were solid discussions, some panels went over time, and, and we did have a great attendance, so thank you. And um, I'd like to thank our fabulous memory study group that made all of that happen with Mark Astoria, Lala Pop, you just met Lala, <laughs> Franci Koenig Paratore. Thank you, thank you guys. And finally, I want to thank our dedicated faculty for their support, advice, assistance, for moderating the panels, for taking part in the round tables. Um, the names are in the program, so I will stop right. <coughs> the closing keynote address by Marcy Shore is entitled The Unwrinkling of Time, How Historicity Inflects the Flattened Present. Before I introduce Marcy, I'd like to share with you a tiny poem by the late Polish poet and Nobel Prize laureate, Wisława Szymborska. And, um, and I think at this conference, um, it will serve well all of us. Uh, the title of the poem is The Three Oddest Words. When I pronounce the word future, the first syllable already belongs to the past. When I pronounce the word silence, I destroy it. When I pronounce the word nothing, I make, I make something that non-being, no non-being can hold. Uh, Marcy Shore is uh, associate professor at Yale University in the Department of History, um, and a very regular visiting fellow at the Institute für die Wissenschaft from, from Menschen in Vienna. She is speaking to us today from Vienna. She is an intellectual historian, or as I would prefer to call her, a historian and a historian of ideas. An exciting thinker, charismatic speaker, and fabulous writer. Um, here is the, I need to, I have to read the, the, the titles of, the, of her books, Caviar and Ashes, A Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, 1918-1968. The taste, taste of Ashes, The Afterlife of Totalitarianism in Eastern Europe. And finally, the recent one, the relatively recent one, The Ukrainian Night, an intimate history of revolution. These are the books that you should read. <laughs> but again, I'm, I will stop here as Marcy's bio is included in the conference program. And instead I'd like to invite her. Uh, Marcy, the floor is yours, or that is the screen. <laughs> Marcy, sure. Uh, well, thank you so much, Elzbieta. And thank you to Malkaz and thank you to my colleagues for inviting me. I am so impressed with my colleagues who have maintained the energy and motivation to organize these events and exchanges, even through the mediation of the screen. I'm trying very hard to have a better attitude about the screen, but I keep imagining myself as if I were in an episode of the Jetsons from the 1970s and 1980s. I'm trying to get over that feeling. Um, I poured myself a glass of wine, so I'm gonna pretend like we're all kind of sitting around at a cafe and I'm just chatting with you. But in the meantime, let me first tell everybody who I can't see anybody except for Elspieta, but let me tell the rest of you who are listening, 
I do not plan on, I'm not going to use any visuals for you know the next 45 minutes that I'm going to talk. So please feel free to turn away from the screen. You probably all spend too much time looking at the screen. You know, in general, I know it's maddening to look at the screen all the time. Please like look outside, look at look at the trees, make some coffee, feel free to, you know, do the dishes, fold the laundry, sweep the floor, you know, jog on the treadmill. I'm just going to talk. You, you really don't have to look at me. Um, all right, um, so it's you, but some of you, is, I'm sure the Americans at least have noticed that I have stolen my title from the extraordinary children's author, Mad Little Angle. And I will come to that in a moment. And her series of books, which begins with kind of the now legendary Wrinkle in Time, which was one of my favorite books from childhood, which I now read with my kids. It's lasted, you know, it's lasted through the generations. Um, I wanna go back to 1989 um, and the feeling of temporal rupture of 1989. Uh, I was, you know, running around Eastern Europe as a young person in the early mid 1990s, not having really any understanding of what communism was about, trying to understand what it was about and trying to understand what had shifted. And the one thing I understood immediately, you know, even from suburban Pennsylvania, you know, and even not knowing anything about communism when I heard that the Berlin Wall fell is that this was a huge break in time. That one world, you know, one set of expectations, one understanding of how the world was organized had suddenly come to an end kind of radically and abruptly and very excitingly and something new was beginning. So I understood it was a moment of rupture, but I didn't necessarily understand very well what had come before. And as I was kind of running around as a student in first in Prague and then in Bratislava and then in a small town called Domažlica in Western Bohemia, um, constantly asking people questions. One thing I heard again and again from all different people, you know, be they dissidents or be they young people or be they waitresses, you know, at a bar, was that nobody ever thought they would see it end in their lifetime. That the timeline they had been experiencing in the 70s and 80s felt like it was stretching into an infinite horizon. Nobody had expected 1989 to happen until the moment it happened. And it captured me this sense, not only that it was a surprise, but what so many of the Czechs and Slovaks were trying to describe to me at that time, like taking into consideration their nascent English and my nascent Czech and so imperfect circumstances for conversation. But the motif that was coming up again and again was not only that they never thought they would see it end in their lifetime, but a feeling as if time hadn't moved, more or less for two decades that time hadn't moved. And people who were by then in their 40s or 50s or 60s were talking about 1968 as the last moment when time moved. Then came the invasion and then it, it slowed down and then it stopped. Time felt like it, it had stopped. And so that captured my imagination. What does it mean that time had stopped? That time felt like it, had, it wasn't moving at all. For a very long time, it wasn't moving. I mean, now I'm older, but at the time I was 22, I mean, I wasn't even born yet in 1968. So the idea that time had stopped for 20 years, it seemed like a very long time for time to have been stopped. Um, and then I understood they were trying to describe that it stopped. And then what 1989 was like was this jolt forward, you know, as if, as if there had been like a traffic jam on the highway and you were standing and standing and standing. And then all of a sudden there was this kind of jolt. Um, and it, it was rough and it had a certain violence to it, even if it wasn't literal violence, but there was something quite harsh about that jolting. And, and later on, uh, you know, as I became, as I went to graduate school, as I became a historian, I kept going back to that moment and trying to understand that sense that time had stopped and then it had suddenly accelerated. 
that time was not going at a kind of constant stable pace all the time, that it had slowed down almost to a halt and then suddenly it jolted forward. And one of the things that kept coming back to my mind, um, and this shows my Americanness, uh, was Madeleine La Engel's novel, A Wrinkle in Time, uh, which she originally published in 1962. If any of you haven't read it, it's widely available. It's constantly in print. You know, it's been translated to many different languages. I recommend it. Um, it's basically a fantasy novel for humanists. Um, the heroine is a, an awkward 14-year-old named Meg, who together with her five-year-old genius brother, Charles Wallace, and their friend Calvin, who is also a teenager, travel through the universe to the dark planet of Kamazot, which is controlled by an evil disembodied brain called It, where Megan, Charles Wallace's father, is being held prisoner. And the way they travel there is the kind of bending of the time-space continuum that allows for these dramatic leaps that encompass both the temporal and the spatial. So it's kind of taking off on you know, Einstein's idea that time and space are related. That you know, if you can kind of put this kind of wrinkle in time, you can kind of make this jump through space. So I was thinking about that as I was trying to figure out how do you grasp this idea of a jump? This idea that time is not steady, it's not constant. You know, and later when I was teaching, I was trying to find ways to explain it to my students because then I was facing, uh, I was facing another generation. Um, and one of the moments I realized I was facing another generation was perhaps 15 years ago or so, I was teaching at Indiana University and I didn't, I didn't expect that there was actually going to be a generational difference at that time between myself and my students. Because I would say, you know, 31 and they were, you know, they were 21. So I, I felt like I was the same generation. And then I was teaching Milan Kundera's novel, The Joke, which again, if you haven't read it, you should run out and read it now. I still think it's his best novel, even though it's his, his first one and in some ways his least well-known. I was teaching that novel, The Joke, which is set during the Stalinist period in Prague. And the student, I, one of my best students was in fact giving the presentation that day in the seminar, you know, and he said, he began saying, okay, the protagonist of this novel, his name is Ludwig, and Ludwig is a Communist Party member and he's a university student. Everything is going very well for him. And then one day, you know, just as a joke, he sends his girlfriend this email. And I, I, I stopped. I said, Brett, no. And he's, he's looking at me like, what? Well, what did I say? That was wrong. Like, I read the book. But I'm like, no, no. It, it wasn't an email. <laughs> it was a postcard. <laughs> then one day he sent his girlfriend a postcard. Um, but I realized I was the only one who noticed that he said something odd and that it wasn't, of course, that he hadn't read the book carefully. It was in his mind, the postcard was automatically transposed into an email because how else would you communicate? You would send an email. You know, I'm like, no, no, think Prague, 1952, think no email, <laughs> like before email. And that's when I realized that unlike I grew up without email. I didn't use emails on my last year in college and that these students who were only 10 years younger have no memories pre-email, that they just couldn't conceive of a world without email. Um, and then I started thinking about how that, that surrealism of the idea of someone in Stalinist Prague sending an email being even greater than the surrealism of you know, someone in the 1950s America sending an email. And so then I was thinking about that change in time and technology. You know, and one of the things, and I'm sure Alberto will remember this too, when I first started running around Eastern Europe, especially when you got outside of the major cities, people didn't have telephones. They had never had telephones, you know, or, you know, one or two people had telephones and you would like give somebody your friend's telephone number, or there were telephone booths or appointments at the post office. And people were constantly waiting in lines at these phone booths and there were phone cards and, or somebody's village was getting a telephone or a phone booth. And that was a big deal. And that of course changed the whole speed of life because you couldn't call people and, you know, arrange things quickly. And then suddenly, you know, two or three years later, you know, while people were still had their names on these lists to get phones, it was all forgotten about because suddenly everyone had cell phones. 
So you just like skipped the stage of landlines and you went right to cell phones, which of course was completely logical. I mean, if you're on a waiting list for five years to get a landline, why would you wait to get a landline when a cell phone comes? And that of course changed everything. I mean, it definitely changed the pace of expectations. You know, it used to be you were just like standing around the town square waiting for somebody to show up and maybe they'd show up when they said they would or maybe they wouldn't. But in any case, you didn't have any way of calling or changing. And suddenly everybody is, you know, texting everyone like every five minutes and the whole pace has picked up exponentially. So I started thinking about this idea of leapfrogging. Um, you know, what does it also mean if you're kind of leapfrogging, you know, over stages? Because the difference between how it affects your life and sense of time to go from never having had a telephone to go from having a cell phone is a more radical shift than to go from having a landline to having a cell phone. So how do those, how do those more radical shifts, those bigger leaps, how do they affect people's sense of time? Um, and then I was reminded, you'll see I do a lot of kind of stream of consciousness chains of association thing. I was reminded of Isaiah Berlin's thesis about you know, what happened in the Russian empire? You know, how do we eventually end up with the Bolshevik revolution? And this is a thesis of an intellectual historian and a philosopher. And Isaiah Berlin is saying that, well, all of this French enlightenment philosophy, Rousseau and Voltaire and Diderot, it takes a while to make its way across the continent into the Russian empire. By the time it gets there, you've already had the German centered romantic reaction. So it's already, you know, Rousseau and Voltaire and Diderot is already all kind of mixed up with, you know, Kant and Hegel and Fichte and, and Schiller. Um, and so you get this, in, and his ideas, you get this particularly incendiary combination because you get everything at once. There's this long delay and then there's a kind of leapfrogging and it all comes at once. And, you know, and then he has this other provocative thesis, which is that, that the fatal import to the Russian empire was not, was not Marx, it was Hegel. That like, okay, maybe it was one thing for the Germans to read Hegel, but you give a little Hegel to the Russians and they get drunk, basically it's all over. You know, the incendiary combination of all of this philosophy and then Hegel was just too much. And they kind of went off the deep end. And this, you know, I'll leave the provocative thesis as it is, I won't argue for or against it, um, but it, it is one reason why it is so interesting to study the reception of Hegel in, in the Russian speaking land. Um, you know, Alexander Herzen writes about how you have phenomenology of spirit. It's not a book that you read, it's an experience. You live through the phenomenology of spirit. It's like a coming of age experience, which you know, for all of you, who maybe most of you listening have even tried to read the phenomenology of spirit. It's an insanely difficult book to read. So it's amazing that people can have such a deeply personal experience of a book that's you know, basically impenetrable upon first reading. I mean, maybe not to those of you who are smarter than I am, but I found it impenetrable upon first reading. And it's taken years to kind of work through it. Okay, um, so leapfrogging. So then the other question along with speed about time, as you're all listening to me pontificate about time here, is direction, is telos. Okay, so you're jumping forward in time to where? So going back to the 1990s, there's this leap in time. The, the pace of time has picked up, not necessarily in a steady way, because you've got these leaps going forward, but there's also supposedly a direction. You know, people are asking where, where are you going? Um, and that's where we get, you know, the famous, you know, Francis Fukuyama's famous thesis of the end of history. Where are we going? You know, we are all going to liberal democracy and we're going to live happily ever after. And I think it's arguably, you know, taken us, you know, the better part of a quarter century since then to fully appreciate that we were exchanging one Hegelian narrative for another Hegelian narrative. You know, that the, there was a Marxist Hegelian narrative that had everyone proceeding inexorably, inevitably um, towards communism. And then there's the, you know, the liberal teleology of progress, the, the end of history Hegelian narrative, which is that we're all proceeding inexorably, inevitably towards liberal democracy. Um, in, in Cheslav Miłosz's terms, you could say it was still the, the Hegelian bite. You know, there was still something biting about the Hegel. There was still something that kind of got its claws into you. But it was, it was a different version, but in some sense, the same trope. So there is a trading of one Hegelian bite for another. Um, only this time, the end of history time in the 1990s, I want to argue was really what Hegel would call the Aufhebung. 
you know, was really the kind of the sublation, the consummation, the kind of dialectical overcoming, because precisely when the end of history was declared, um, and, and Francis Fukuyama, I think, had read Hegel very seriously. In fact, Stephen Siegel makes, has a very interesting analysis of how, like many other people, he in fact read Hegel through Koja's reading of Hegel, um, which I'll, I'll leave aside and won't bore the rest of you with at the moment, but it's a very interesting argument. Um, precisely at that time, everyone stopped talking about Hegel or metaphysics at all. So in some ironic sense, this second Hegelian bite, you know, came along with you know, the end of Hegel, the overcoming, the self-overcoming of Hegelianism, along with the overcoming of metaphysics entirely. It was the end of history, it was the end of metaphysics, everything was resolved, you know, and over, we put it away. We don't need to talk about these big things like being in and of itself and being in consciousness and, and the, the emergence of the I and responsibility, like all of that kind of, you know, metaphysical stuff that was going on it's resolved, we've gotten to the end, it's done, we now put it aside. Um, and that was, I think, kind of one way of understanding, you know, European temporality, maybe Western temporality after 1989. And um, Elzbieta was kind enough to mention my most recent book on the Ukrainian revolution. And I'm not gonna to talk to you today about Ukrainian politics at all, but what I wanna say, about the Maidan is that what so captured me about the Maidan in 2013, especially in 2014, um, was that I understood that this was the return of metaphysics. I didn't have any particular expertise on Ukrainian politics, but I understood that this was the return of metaphysics. You know, this was in some sense what people like Václav Havel, who was never, you know, who was no longer alive at the time, you know, and Adam Miknik when he was saying this is a civilization that needs metaphysics. This is what they were waiting for, the return of metaphysics. The moment where being truth, consciousness, subjectivity, meaning what is worth dying for, the mean when those, when that came back, when that conversation came back and it came back seriously. Um, that's what captured me about the Maidan, you know, and as I, I was drawn into the Maidan, I then became fascinated with something I hadn't expected and didn't anticipate until I started talking to people on, on the inside. And that was how that experience was an experience of the change of temporality. You know, when I started asking people who were there, you know, in different capacities, who were walking around the Maidan, who were cooking food on the Maidan or working as medics on the Maidan, giving concerts, you know, fighting at, at the end, building barricades. They started talking about how time changed on the Maidan and they began to lose track of time. You know, and the first time somebody says they lo lose track of time, you don't think it's any big deal because, okay, people lose track of time, you know, all the time. Like, you know, my son, when he's playing Minecraft, you know, loses track of time. And that's why you have to limit their, you know, time that they get on video games. And, you know, you're reading a book, you lose track of time. But one after another, people kept saying, and then, and then I lost track of time or something, then something strange happened with time. And I don't know how to explain it, but suddenly I couldn't, I couldn't put things in order anymore. And I didn't know if something had happened, you know, a week ago or two weeks ago, you know, or three days ago or an hour ago that the very experience of time was distended. Um, and that was such a consistent refrain that I became kind of captivated by it. Uh, and then it went along with people talking about how they began to fear falling asleep. And everyone began to fear falling asleep. And the, the day no longer was really divided into day and night in the same way. I and mean, suddenly you could call anyone at any hour of the day. Now, maybe if you're 16 or 18, that's like, you can always call anyone at any hour of the day, especially if you have your own cell phone and you're not waking up your parents. Um, but now this was true, you know, whether you were 18 or 28 or 75, like that, the di distinction between day and night um, eroded. You know, and people started fearing falling asleep. And then I thought, well, why are you afraid to fall asleep? Well, you know, I think one of the reasons you're afraid to fall asleep that makes revolutionary time different from ordinary time is you can fall asleep for, you know, for a night or for an hour or for 15 minutes and wake up to discover that the entire world has changed radically 
in the time that you've been asleep. You know, and it's that state of affairs now obtaining is, is not recognizable. And I started to think maybe this is part of, maybe there's something universal about this, what happens to temporality during revolution. You know, this sense of the state of affairs that was obtaining five minutes ago is absolutely irrelevant because at any given moment, everything can change. You know, and what does that do to time and what does your, that do to your experience of being a self in time? And then I was reminded of, of something that my aunt had said to me years earlier. And so my, my aunt and, and her family lived in Battery Park City um, before September 11th, including on September 11th. And on September 11th, you know, my, my aunt had gone to take my cousin, her six-year-old daughter to the elementary school. Um, she stuck around for a while. She was volunteering at the library, doing some project. She left, she was walking by the World Trade Center. She was going to do some errands there. And, and she saw these planes hit the World Trade Center. Um, and she called her husband who, who was working somewhere around Wall Street. And he said, run back to the school, you know, get our, get our daughter. And then I want you to run north and I want you to take this route. And when she was telling me about this a few days later, um, and I was in New York at the time, but I was, I was uptown. I was, I was a postdoc at Columbia. So I was all the way on the Upper West Side. Um, she was telling me about this and she said that, well, at, at first I, I, I said, no, I mean, I can't like, I can't just go take her out of school in the middle of, of the day. And he said, go back to the school, you know, run, get our daughter. I want you to run north. And she was trying to explain why she was resistant. And she said, well, I couldn't absorb. I, I was thinking she's a child. She needs to be educated. You know, children belong at school. There's a law that children have to be at school. She doesn't have a doctor's note. There's no particular reason to pull her out of school in the middle of the day. That's not what we do. She said, I just couldn't absorb quickly enough that that world that had existed half an hour ago was totally irrelevant. That world with all its rules and principles and standard practices that had been obtaining, you know, when I dropped her off an hour ago is, is now absolutely meaningless because we are now in a different world. You know, and that made sense to me because I, well, I'm, I'm more like my aunt than I am like my uncle who was able to think very quickly and figure out that like, not only was there a terrorist attack, but the towers were gonna fall and the wind was blowing this way. Therefore you wanted to go that way because the fire was gonna spread this way. Um, I'm much more like her. So that made, it made sense to me to think like, how could you possibly absorb that quickly that everything that you took for granted, you know, as the parameters in which you were living suddenly ceased to be relevant. And that came back to me during the Maidan. Like that, that's what happens in a revolution. Suddenly what was, what was, you know, what the rules were 15 minutes ago is totally irrelevant because anything can change. And that does something to the experience of time. Afterwards, so to me, the, the Maidan was, it was a moment of the return of metaphysics, which I thought had been lost at this declaration of the end of history. Then we all jump into our consumer paradise. I think Adam McNick once called this the utopian capitalist package in which we assume that liberalism, democracy, human rights, the free market, like they all go together in some completely harmonious, seamless and unproblematic way. And like naturally we're all proceeding to that utopia. And so there's no need for these metaphysical discussions about whether consciousness precedes being or being precedes consciousness. Um, the Maidan was a return to those metaphysical questions. In that sense, it was a kind of retreat from the postmodern into the modern. And then at the end of February, at the culmination of the revolution on the Maidan, there's a sniper massacre. There's some hundred people you know, who are brutally murdered. Um, Yanukovych flees across the border to Russia. Um, the Kremlin illegally you know, annexes Crimea and instigates a war in the Donbass. And immediately, like late February, early March through that spring, you have a sudden return to the postmodern, as if you were kind of going back and redoing that border between modernity and postmodernity. But in this accelerated time frame, again, with this kind of leapfrogging, like within, within days, you know, within a week or two, um, suddenly, yeah, 
suddenly any like as Peter Pomerantz have said nothing was true and everything was possible you know what was happening in Crimea well these little green men appeared well who were these little green men well it was unclear who they were and maybe it was clear but they weren't saying who they were and it was kind of unclear who was a Kremlin agent and who might be a mercenary um, or who might be a kind of you know local thug or gangster or you know somebody who was paid to act on already existing convictions or somebody who was a nationalist or somebody who was indifferent needs some money or it was all very unclear and nobody seemed that there wasn't even a sense that it could or should be disentangled um, and then there was things like the downing of Malaysian Airlines flight um, 17 where suddenly you find the remains of some 300 people decomposing and in, in the heat so for those of you who are, are too young to remember, um, like our current college students, this was July 2014 when a Russian surface to air missile um, shot down this Boeing airliner on the way um, from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Um, it seems that those who downed the plane had been confused. They had, hadn't really understood what they were shooting at, but it was clearly done with Russian equipment um, on, the, on behalf of the separatist in this grotesque war that's been going on in the, in the Donbass. And somehow the story coming out of the Kremlin was then, well, well, who knows? I mean, maybe they were, maybe it was really shot down by Americans or maybe it was really shot down by Ukrainians or maybe thought Putin was in the plane and it was an, you know, an assassination attempt on Putin. Or maybe the CIA had really like stuffed a plane full of dead bodies you know, as a kind of provocation in order to set this up. And there's just one story after another story after another story you know, and not even a kind of attempt to create you know, another kind of coherent narrative. And so there was this feeling that something we had jumped, we had jumped into postmodernity, and that the center of postmodernity at this moment of a kind of leap was precisely this space in post Soviet Ukraine where people were saying, well, it hasn't quite reached modernity yet. Well, it's this kind of post industrial space where it seems as if after 1989 or maybe after 1991, time had been suspended, as if time hadn't moved there, as if it hadn't quite entered modernity. But now you've leapt into post modernity. So another kind of strange leapfrogging. There was Serhi Jadon wrote this brilliant novel, Voroshilovgrad, which is another book that you should all read if you haven't read it, uh, that, that is, is set in 2009 um, in, in the Donbass where this war is taking place. And one thing Serhi told me is that many of his readers just assume that the story takes place in the 1990s. It's obviously post-Soviet. And he finds this confusion understandable because after all, he says in the Donbass, which is where he's from, time moves a bit slowly. He said, I had the feeling somehow after 1991 in the Donbass that people somehow applied the brakes to time, that they just didn't let time move along in a natural way. And, and Serhi Jandan described the result as some some temporally anomalous zones. So I, I like this description of temporally anom anomalous zones. So zo spaces where time has not proceeded in the same way. Um, by the way, on the note of Royal Shilovgrad, so that the hero of that novel is this young guy named Hermann, um, who goes to this gas station to try to figure out what's happening with his brother. And he intends to stay for just a few hours to clarify the situation. He's living in Kharkiv. He doesn't intend to stay in this place where he was born. But after a day, the situation doesn't clarify. And so he plans to stay one more day and then two more days and then maybe a week. And then he falls into timelessness. And it feels like, you know, for those of you who have read Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, it feels like that timelessness that Hans Kostorp, who like, you know, goes to visit, I think it's his cousin, you know, at, at the sanitarium, um, sanatorium on the, on the mountain. And then like, it seems like maybe he's not feeling well, or maybe nobody is feeling well because they diagnosed everyone with the same thing there. But somehow he ends up staying for a bit and then he just stays and stays and stays. And then you're like stuck in this timeless space with Hans Kostor. And I know people who say they find this novel very relaxing because time just kind of grinds to a halt on the Magic Mountain and you just kind of hang out there with Hans Kostor. I find it totally anxiety producing and maddening. Like the whole time you just want to shake him and say, get out of there, get out of there. Don't you, don't you see what's happening? You've fallen into the zone where, where there's no time. Um, in any case, this little, that's a little footnote. Um, 
So there's this feeling that the Donbass had been this place where, where time had kind of slowed down almost to a halt. And then suddenly you get this bizarre neo-totalitarian filled with provocation postmodernism and this kind of surreal juxtaposition of the pre-modern with postmodern. I mean, you get these kind of gangster warlord types who are using Twitter. Um, and so it was, it was another weird leap in time, you know, a place where time had been as if suspended and then there's some strange leap forward. Um, okay, um, so let me, let's see, I'm probably, I, it's very weird for me to talk and not see people's faces. I've noticed I talk for much too long. Um, let me step back and like make some comments more, more generally or about, about revolutions and temporality and then kind of move on to, yeah, I eventually kind of want to end with our present weird suspension in time. Um, and is it as maddening as what happens to Hermann and Voroshil of Grad or to Hans Kostorp in, in the Magic Mountain? Um, so this revolutionary idea of the revolution as a turn, as a turning, you know, as die Wende, as they say in, in, in German, like the turn, the turnaround, has both kind of spatial and temporal dimensions. Um, I think you can make an argument that, you know, if if Bolshevism that there's something, there's some a tragic flaw in the whole history of Bolshevism, has to do with Lenin's modification of Marxism, and of course, you know, Lenin, you know, Lenin revises Marxism in many different ways, but one way to think of Leninism is the idea that history can be rushed, the idea that yes, yes, it's moving in this direction. But if we just kind of let it take its own course, it'll get there eventually, but it's going to take too long. And Lenin is impatient. And it was all, it was all about the idea that history could be nudged. We could rush history. We could literally increase the speed. We could accelerate. We could kind of jump start a little bit. Um, you could make an argument that rushing time was the original sin of the Bolshevik revolution. You know, could time be rushed? But you also see that sense of revolutionary time. When I was working on this book in the Maidan, I became obsessed with this experience of temporality and trying to understand what my Ukrainian friends and colleagues interlocutors were saying to me. And I started reading a lot about revolutions in time. Um, and I went back and reread John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World and, and Mikhail Bulgakov's White Guard. And you really feel time accelerate in those books. And if you reread now, I realize it's like they're not the kind of book people reread most these days. But if you look at John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World, the experience of dizzying temporality, of just time rushing forward so that the whole world can change so radically as to be unrecognizable in the course of an hour. You feel that so vividly in that book. And Bulgakov's White Guard, it's basically 24 hours in Kiev. You know, and it's like you, you, the whole world has been turned around two or three times in the course of this 24 hours. It's a long novel, you know, and it takes place in a day. Um, so the, the sense of the acceleration of time together with this rupture of time, this break in time and then acceleration seems somehow very essential about the experience of revolution. I mean, in both the French revolutionaries and the Bolsheviks, they wanted to begin the calendar anew. You, know, you start over again, you know, you start with year one. Um, okay, so as I was working about this, I then began obs obsessing about the, the problem of the philosophy of time. Um, and okay, so you start thinking about time. Okay, you've got these three dimensions, you know, which uh, uh, Wisława Szymborska alluded to, or Elżbieta via Wisława Szymborska alluded to um, in the introduction. You have past, present, and future. And what's the problem with the present? Well, it's really the present that's a problem because it, it has no duration, because it's punctual. You know, how do you, it's exactly what, what Szymborska was saying. Like if you, if you say the word future, by the time you've pronounced the first syllable, it's already in the past. There's no way to hold on to it because the present has no length. I, I then like I, I then started harassing my um, my poor brother-in-law who is a plasma physicist and works on clean energy um, <laughs> about to, like to tell me about the experience of the present from the point of view of a physicist. He humors me about these things a lot, and he said, "Well, you know, and, you know, Phil says, yeah, in physics we talk about t equals zero, your time is zero. That's the present. He said, but it's purely theoretical. 
actually the present doesn't exist. And there's nothing, you can't, because it has no duration, it doesn't really exist. So then I went back and I, I not only did I reread, but I forced all my students to read um, Henri Bergson, Time is Duration, the relationship between space and time. And Bergson's idea was that space could be divided up into discrete, you get discrete quantities. Um, it, it could be thought of in a quantitative way. Whereas time had to be thought of in a qualitative way. It was like the difference in calculus between the discrete and the continuous. So you can have a set of all, of all the, the whole numbers of all the integers, one, two, three, four, five, but you can also have a set of all the points on the number line, which include all the numbers say between zero and one, you know, which cannot be, you can't slice them up because it's continuous. It's not discrete, it's continuous. So Bergson is saying space is discrete. You can think of space as being discrete. You can cut it up. You can quantify it. You can't think of time that way. Time is a flow. It's continuous. You know, it's, it's like a, a melody. You know, it, it has, it always has duration. It's thick. You know, it turns out that he actually got into a polemic with Einstein about this. Um, and I had a senior essay student, Calvin McCafferty, who wrote a great senior essay about this last year during the quarantine about Bergson's polemic with Einstein. His polemic with Einstein had to do with Einstein's talking about comparing instants. And Bergson's like, there are no instants in time. You can't talk about an instant. They can't be isolated. There's only flow. Um, and along with this idea of flow that could not be divided into instants or points, Bergson argues that the spatializing of time dissolves contingency and with it our creative agency. Yeah. Then I went on to Husserl and Husserl's idea of, of the present was that it was always inflected with what he called retention and protention, which is basically like the past and the future. You're always kind of retaining a bit like when you're listening to a melody, retaining a bit of what has just passed, you know, and kind of jumping ahead in anticipation to what is coming. So your experience of the present as you really experience it is always inflected by this retention of the past and protension, this anticipation of the future. Yeah, like when you're listening to music, for Bergson too, music is always kind of the metaphor here. Um, and then I, of course, went on to Arendt because at any you know, moment of instability, like it's always a return to Arendt kind of moment. You know, and Arendt has this fascinating reading of time that she takes from this very eccentric parable that appears, I think, in one of Kafka's diaries um, by an unnamed narrator. And Kafka's parable that Arendt describes you know, has to do with an unnamed narrator, the subject, who is basically caught, you know, in this battle between the past and the future. Except that instead of the past pulling him back and the future pulling him forward, it's somehow the opposite. It's they're both crashing in on him. You know, that instead of pulling back, the, the, the past is pressing forward, you know, and instead of pulling forward, it's the future driving back, you know, and Arendt says, seen from the viewpoint of man who kind of lives in that interview between past and future, time is not a continuum. It's not an uninterrupted flow. It's broken in the middle at that moment of the present. And the problem is that the moment of the present is then a battlefield. It can never be a home because you're always being crushed by, by both sides. You know, Arendt says about Kafka's protagonist that he's only aware of the existence of this gap in time, which as long as he lives is the ground on which he must stand, though it seems to be a battlefield and not at home. Um, and finally, I went on to Sartre, who actually seemed to give me the best understanding of the present from the point of view of revolutionary temporality. Uh, and, and Sartre basically says that the present is, is a border. I mean, he has to say, like, the present is a problem because it has no duration. You can't hold on to it. As soon as you try to grab it, it's already gone um, because it has no length. You know, and Sartre says the time is really a border. It's the border between the past and the future. But the past and the future overlaps with what Sartre calls the en soi and the pour soi, the in itself and the for itself, um, which roughly overlaps with what he also describes as facticity and transcendence. And basically the in itself, the en soi facticity is what has already happened, what you have been, who you have been, what has already been done, what cannot be changed. 
whereas the poor soi, the for itself, the transcendence, is the potential to go beyond what has been, to go further, to overcome, to make some change, to go beyond. Um, and that, that's what the present is every moment of our lives. It's only a border. It has no length. It can't be held onto. It's only a border. And I thought that's what the revolutionary moment was. It's, the, it's like you cast a glaring light on that border. You suddenly illuminate the present moment as that border in all its borderness, in all its liminality. And it's that moment, that border, that's, you know, it, it's the algenblick. It's the moment of choice. You know, it's the moment when there's an imperative of choice and a possibility of choice. It's the moment of self-creation. It's the moment of overcoming. It's the moment of your greatest freedom and your greatest responsibility. That is the present. You know, it's like you suddenly cast a glaring light on that moment that's with us all the time. Okay, I'm going to stop, stop um, chattering about Satra, and I'm going to end here in the next few minutes by talking about our present moment, which the, in German is called Corona Zeit, because as I'm sure most of you know, in German, you just kind of smush words together, and then you get a new word, um, you know, which makes German very flexible for these situations, you know, and so you have Corona Zeit, which is the time of Corona. Um, which is another sudden, different, violent, rough jump into a new time. And I was thinking about this last spring, you know, when a week, two, three weeks, you know, into this very sudden and abrupt lockdown, Yale sent all our students home, suddenly everything is closed. It's something we couldn't have imagined, you know, a week or two before. And I thought, imagine a person from six months in the past can suddenly like, you know, wake up from a coma and look in on what's happening now. You know, and imagine that we're some kind of riddle for this person. And he hears people screaming like we were constantly screaming at, at our kids and their best friends. Six feet, six feet, you know, Talia and Elen, that is not six feet. Stay six feet apart. Um, he sees people screaming six feet. Like, how would you even have any idea like what that meant? You know, if somebody like came back from six months in the past or even six weeks in the past, it would have been nonsensical. Suddenly there are shortages of toilet paper, whole wheat flour and dumbbells. So again, it's like a riddle. You know, what would the social circumstances be if there is a sudden shortage of toilet paper, whole wheat flour and dumbbells? The animal shelters are running out of pets. You know, how do you let, you know, Yale is sending out emails with news items that say things like Yale researchers aim to uncover the secrets to happiness with new smartphone app. So put all those things together and think how if you just woke up from a coma, you know, for say a week or two, could you envision this new situation? You know, so suddenly you're just thrust into this whole new state of affairs. Um, Suddenly, everyone is including time zones in their emails. You know, you're invited to talk here, to participate in this seminar here. Everyone is posting their time zone. When did anyone start, start posting time zones? At a certain moment, it became natural. Everyone said, oh, yes, and this is beginning at, you know, one o'clock in this time zone or at 12 o'clock in that time zone. Um, people aren't leaving their homes. You lose the rhythm of the days. You forget what day of the week it is. Um, you start checking numbers in the morning. A lot of us had the same, America had this experience, like obsessively checking the 538 website, you know, during the elections. Well, now you have this experience, you're checking the infection rates. Are the numbers going up? Are they down? Are they, are they staying the same? Now we're checking vaccination numbers. Um, and yet it's, so it's a radical change in temporality and it's the obverse of revolutionary time. Because it, it, one, it doesn't have this sense of sacred space about it. Now it's all about the mundane. In revolutionary time, you felt like there was this light cast on this algenblick, this moment of choice when everything was at stake. Um, and now suddenly you've descended into the everyday, this kind of sinking into the everyday. Um, Jan Patochka talks about how, how boredom is not merely a mood, but it's the ontological condition of a humanity which has wholly subordinated its life to everydayness and its anonymity. Um, I think moving in space speeds time, but remaining at home flattens it, you know, and it's not only slowed, but it somehow stopped, 
you know, I was recording my, I was audio recording my lectures for my lecture course in the fall and I, I to my daughter's stuffed animal, she would pick out a different stuffed animal for each lecture because she didn't think it was fair that any given stuffed animal be made to suffer through more than one lecture because she was sure that they were extremely boring. I found this a little bit offensive, but so like, you know, the stuffed wild pig got to listen to Heidegger and there was a stuffed carrot that got to listen to Sasha. Um, but I found that like, you know, I'm supposed to give a 50 minute lecture. When I'm in the classroom, it would be a 50 minute lecture and I would end at 50 minutes and everyone would leave. Suddenly I'm like, it's 75 minutes and I'm sitting here chatting like with these stuffed animals who are giving me no feedback. This is completely absurd. I've lost any sense of time and I'm, and I'm talking to a stuffed carrot. Um, so you, you lose track of time and somehow the obverse way that you lose track of time in a revolution. I found myself constantly setting cell phone alarms so that I don't miss classes and meetings, which I've never had to do when I was actually going to them in person. I've never set my cell phone alarm so that I forget to show up in my class, whereas I find I have to do that on, on Zoom. Um, okay, so I, I want to, I guess, just say in conclusion that the I want to go back to this idea of the end of history and that the arrival of this plague has kind of coincided roughly with the end of the end of history. You know, if we traded one Hegelian narrative for another, perhaps now it, it's really over. Um, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht wrote this book after 1945 about how this was the end of the historicist chronotope and we've lost this sense of the future as this open horizon we're moving towards the present has become inundated with the past we're unable to leave the past behind I wasn't sure that that was true before it feels true now in this suspended present. It feels like the suspended present has in some way become saturated and inundated with the past. And I'm wondering if maybe it's not a coincidence that a belated reckoning with slavery and racism took place in the states at this particular moment. I mean, you can argue that this reckoning has been going on constantly, you know, throughout my lifetime, throughout the lifetimes of my parents, but something feels different now. Um, our, our, colleague Jeff Goldfarb just wrote about, about the Derek Chauvin verdict, that he was relieved but not surprised. Um, now you can say he was not surprised because Jeff is a chronically hopeful human being, you know, who it, it's hardwired in him to believe that eventually good will triumph, that someday we'll get there. But maybe there's something more about this relief, but not surprised. Not surprised because it feels like something has shifted, that maybe the reckoning is taking place on a deeper, more widespread level now. Maybe that has something to do with the past saturating the suspended present. Um, I, I want to leave you on, on a, a hopeful note um, with the, the hope that you know, when the plague recedes, and I, I want to be hopeful like Jeff and say the plague is going to recede, time will inevitably speed up again. And I'm hopeful that this could be the chance for the emergence of a more you know, robust non-Hegelian historicity. Um, if we have a belated recognition now that the whole liberal utopian capitalist package was just another version of the Hegelian bite, um, you know, I just finished listening on audiobooks to Obama's The Promised Land, um, and he is a wonderful writer and he is so self-reflective. But in some sense, the short version of The Promised Land is there's no such thing as The Promised Land. You know, I, I just like had organized this Seder recently for my kids and I'm like, we should just, we should focus on getting out of slavery and not obsess about the promised land because the short, the short version of the story is there's no actual promised land. So if we put aside that Hegelian telos idea, you know, maybe we can come into a sense of historicity that is more responsible. You know, Alexei Navalny keeps saying, I don't know how he like, I don't know how he thinks that like, um, but this, you know, everything will be okay. I have a hard time getting behind that, but I think there is a possibility that, you know, as we move, you know, into a more accelerated sense of time, maybe, maybe we could get out of this suspended present, let time move forward without the same kind of complacent sense of the end of history or that there is a telos. Um, and let me at least leave you with Jan Patochka's idea that, that the I, the subject, um, subjectivity itself emerges when history emerges. 
And but when Patochka says when history emerges, he means when history emerges as something problematic, as something of which we are self-conscious and self-reflective, when pre-given meaning is shaken. This turn to self-reflection, self-consciousness, this awareness of history is a problem, is the moment when the I emerges as a real subject. So maybe as we come out of this suspended present that has been inundated with the past, may this be the shakenness of pre-given meaning and hopefully the emergence of an I who is unafraid and daring to ask the right questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we don't really have time for questions, but as I was listening to the to, to your talk and particularly to the latter part of your talk, I actually myself became much more hopeful, not optimistic, but hopeful. And as I thought that maybe what you just described um, so well, the kind of flattened temporality, the suspension of the time and how different it is. And on the other hand, how similar it is to revolutionary time that perhaps what we are experiencing right now here and in this country, but I think also in other parts of the world that, that suddenly the, the space emerged in which things which were of great importance, but were, they were never addressed are now coming to the to the surface and we can take care of that there were events of course which prompted mm. that so uh, uh maybe we are in a different mm. new time of revolution a fundamental change of things that we wanted mm. to change and never did uh, uh, I don't know who's there still, but um, thank you. Thank you all. And I wanted to invite you to visit our uh, website. There, there, there's a lot of exciting things um, happening. Um, we are going to have Marcy, perhaps not one more time, but many more times, as she's actually working with us. And, um, and do join in the coffees and the conversations run by Jeff Goldfarb. Um, within our democracy seminar frame. Um, do visit us in our open, open uh, events, uh, which we are going to run this um, summer in July at the New York Wrocław online, unfortunately, Summer Institute Democracy and Diversity. It will be opened by the Nobel Prize Laureate, by the talk by the Nobel Prize Laureate. Um, another Pole, Polish woman, good, um, Olga Tokarczuk on July um, 7th, um, stay with us and uh, be well and be safe. And thank you very much for being with us during those few days of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>